Hello. Uh, yeah, thanks for coming. Thanks for joining. So this uh, talk is uh, the slides are uh, for a more generic audience. So please, uh, I'll maybe I'll try to go a little faster, which means that we'll have a lot of time for questions. So please, uh, uh, please just stop me and ask. Uh, so the overall kind of the obligatory slides the slides on agt so the overall kind of goal really is uh, in in this work is to get a, a reduction from uh, algorithms to mechanisms so and and kind of that uh, is as generic as possible even at the expense of other properties so it's a, it's a kind of maybe the overall kind of uh, Starting point is being envious of, uh, of my optimization friends who basically have this pipeline from uh, convex to non-convex algorithms where they do this magic trick and uh, design a better uh, gradient descent heuristic that uh, proves something about convex case and then get some, something that actually works well in non-convex for non-convex optimization. So. Uh, wouldn't it be nice to have something like this for mechanism design? So here a reduction would mean we start uh, we start with a, with an algorithm and uh, turn it into a mechanism. So uh, of course the difference, yeah. So a generic reduction would mean that it somehow at least in some sense accounts makes a truthful accounts for so that agents actually report their types uh, while preserving the good properties of the algorithm. So in terms of in the literature, what kinds of reductions exist? So in many cases, uh, the best kind of mechanisms we have are actually non-reductions in the sense that uh, the best mecha uh, mechanism doesn't look at all like the best algorithms we have. So you solve the same problem in a different way that kind of builds in incentives from the beginning. Uh, on the other spectrum, end of the spectrum, you just make uh, black box calls to the algorithm. Unfortunately, in many cases, this doesn't work. So we, or either doesn't work or you get approximation factors. We want to have no, our goal is to kind of, so, so we want no approximation factors. We want no significant slowdown. And the question is what can we get or at least what can we hope to get, uh, even if we cannot prove it. Uh, so uh, another kind of, and, and, but, and the goal is to also extend to heuristics. So the, the white box or open box mechanism modifies the algorithm in some prescribed way to account for, hopefully to make it account for incentives. And uh, the hope here is to extend to heuristics because uh, many algorithms themselves are not so they, they exist in this annoying space where if you were to prove something about them you wouldn't get nice results but they actually work well in practice so you're competing with trying to recover that performance uh, so uh, today we'll talk about uh, iterated optimization based algorithms without money which is another development in some sense from the last 10 years that basically more and more things, even uh, things like classical algorithm, definitely in practice because inspired by ML, but also in theory for things like uh, max flow, things do start looking like iterated uh, optimization, local optimization. Uh, so actually there are fewer algorithms to worry about, which, is, uh, which means, uh, which is nice if you're in the business of reductions. So that's that's uh, overall today's framework. The goal is you have an iterated optimization. So think about your favorite gradient descent type algorithm, and we want uh, to turn it into a mechanism. Uh, so we'll use connections between three ingredients to our extremely standard uh, well, actually, at this level of abstraction, all are pretty standard, pretty kind of uh, their whole fields, basically. But uh, optimization, which is kind of where the algorithm comes from, online learning, 
and correlated equilibria. So those are the connections and uh, we'll use two existing uh, reductions or uh, generic connections that are very kind of, it shouldn't be uh, that are very standard and very well studied. So the first one is VCG. Uh, the second one is correlated equilibria from a repeated play. And the third ingredient is slightly less standard is something called bandits with knapsacks, uh, which is uh, an extension of the bandit online learning model. Uh, so I'll talk about it in slightly more detail because this is something that's more recent. Perhaps the theory has been developed only in the last 10 years or so. Okay, so, uh, so, and I want to think about those as reductions between kind of back and forth between, optimi uh, between optimization and uh, mechanisms or game theory. So the first reduction is, uh, I mean, maybe that's not how people usually conceptualize it, but you can think about VCG as a, a reduction for perfect optimization to mechanisms with money, of course. So the VCG mechanism, it, is it's, it can be summarized essentially in one sentence. You maximize total utility, charge each player their externality, uh, rinse, repeat. Um, so the externality is uh, the loss of utility to other players due to having to accommodate preferences of player I. Uh, so formally, uh, and we'll stick to those notations, each player, there is some outcome space X, each player uh, has uh, a utility function fi from x to say non-negative reals. Um, the mechanism maximizes uh, total utility and then charges each player the difference. So this is the externality. The first term is how happy could you make everyone else if you didn't need to worry about player i versus how happy everyone else is uh, as is. So the standard example for this is uh, if uh, the goal is to allocate one item, one indivisible item among n players, the outcome space in this case is who gets the item, the utility of player i, so they don't care. If I don't get it, they don't care what happens. So it's one, it's vi if I get it and zero otherwise. And the VCG will give it to the highest value player and charge them second highest value because that's how happy everyone else would be if player I didn't want it. So that's uh, VCG, I mean, problem solved, right? We can go home. Uh, okay, so it, it does have impo important advantages. Uh, reporting the true utility is a dominant strategy. Uh, so it's one of the stronger kind of guarantees in terms of truthfulness. Uh, it's kind of guaranteed to be optimal by definition. It com it's completely general, so we didn't need to, to know what the Fs are. Uh, there are important drawbacks, so it's kind of it depends on the setting, why exactly is it rare to actually see VCG as is used. Uh, so for us, remember, our goal is to develop mechanisms without money. So yeah, so it's so immediate that requiring money is, is a problem for us. Uh, you also need kind of an, a pretty sensitive to an explicit knowledge of utility. So if it's being discovered or something, it's, it's, it's very hard to, so if F is some complicated, if X is a very complicated space, uh, you uh, basically where it's unrealistic to have, so say you only have a gradient oracle for the FIs, it's not, uh, it, it, it gets tricky. Uh, and uh, another actually important practical reason and also theoretical problem is that it fails under approximations. Uh, so remember, this is the price. Now imagine that there are a thousand players and, but you have a very good heuristic or, or approximation algorithm that gets you within 1%. So the price is a difference between two large numbers. So each of these is roughly a thousand times more than what the player i's utility. So if you subtract two very large numbers, you get a very noisy number. 
So just because two numbers are within, if, if you have two large numbers that are each correct within 1%, the difference might not be correct within 1%. And that's that's a big problem. So it's very noisy. And uh, so yes. So but overall, it's it's still it has very nice properties. So a second kind of uh, reduction in in this space is from low regret learning to correlated equilibria. Uh, so in the context of strategic games, uh, yeah. So there are, there is the notion of Nash equilibria, which uh, corresponds to which uh, so it's a distribution of actions such that no player benefits from deviating an approximate an epsilon nash that means that uh, you may benefit from deviating but only a little bit uh, and both of those are, so it's within the AGT community we have negative uh, lower bounds uh, even conceptually they are difficult to reason about uh, so yeah, so I guess one piece of evidence for that is that even epsilon Nash is computationally hard to find. Prob probably, definitely good epsilon Nash is computationally hard to find. Uh, and kind of uh, in practice, okay, so it's debatable whether it's a problem or not, but in, in practice, we are dealing with correlated equilibria. So games don't exist in a vacuum. There is always a signal a lot of signal and kind of if you don't like the outcome you just add more signal so we are dealing with correlated equilibria uh, so uh, formally uh, and mathematically it's a much nicer object as as uh, it, uh, as, uh, as we know and uh, we'll see why in a second um, so in a correlated equilibrium each player observes an additional signal given the signal players choose strategy and uh, so without loss of generality the strategy tells them how to play and an epsilon correlated equilibrium is one where players don't benefit from not following the proposed action except with a kind of derived very small benefit and uh, the you know when we teach it in a class the first example is the traffic light so when it's green you drive when it's red you stop because uh, uh, you know that the other party will have a green and you don't want to cause an accident. Uh, the most important example for us is markets with prices. So uh, posted prices, so in a market, posted prices induce a truthful response from market participants. So if you have like a supermarket, there are prices for everything, uh, you will, choose your favorite bundle of goods given those prices you so it's a, it's a truthful mechanism on the other hand it's a correlated equilibrium it's not a nash equilibrium because if there are no posted prices and you need to negotiate the prices uh you will try participants will try to influence prices by misreporting utilities and then there are all kinds of negatives so for example the myerson setter quite no trade theorem says that even that basically even in a two play one buyer one seller setting if they need to if the buyer and the seller need need to haggle sometimes there'll be no trade uh, even though there should be because that's how they try because players will try to influence the sale price by bluffing and sometimes this bluff will backfire uh, in large markets this problem is less pronounced but uh but it's definitely it's kind of i would say that this is a, a lot even a, a bigger score for correlated equilibria than the computational aspect because it already occurs in places where there is no i mean it's literally means that uh, in a nash equilibrium you can't solve one inequality uh, so is the buyer value on this item more than the seller or not without losing something constant uh another for, for algorithms the most important connection is correlated equilibria are essentially online learning so uh basically if you run a, it's not completely true but it's slightly oversimplifying but you take a game you train robots to play it uh using some low regret strategies you get a correlated equilibrium formally you need a stronger property called swap regret uh, but 
a negligible swap regret is something that's attainable uh, using online learning. Also can be done directly using a linear program, which makes correlated equilibria tractable. So, uh, and uh, which brings us to the online learning. So let's ignore incentives for a second. So this problem has, I mean, it's very well studied and now kind of uh, there is also an explosion of heuristics, which partly kind of, we got into this trying to capture the gap, the growing gap between theorems and heuristics for online learning and for optimization, which is kind of almost the same thing. Uh, so generally speaking, online learning is easy. Anything that's not obviously impossible for information theoretic reasons is usually attainable. So it's it's mostly good news. Uh, by some, and usually you can attain it by some version of gradient descent, empirical loss minimization. And uh, so let's, for this talk, let's say online learning is easy. So the final ingredient is something called bandits with knapsacks, which is an extension. Uh, can, can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah. Can you go back uh, to the previous slide? Uh, so what's the information theoretical reason for uh, not learning Nash equilibrium? So for Nash equilibrium, this doesn't, I, this. I like, mean, you said that, I mean, Nash equilibrium cannot be learned online. I mean, the, that's, uh, I'm taking this as uh, being known. I mean, it's 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 hard. It's a hard problem to learn. Yes. And you are saying that. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to understand what you mean for for this example. What you mean by these information theoretic reasons? So Nash equilibrium, the breakdown is not in online learning. The breakdown is it's not online learnable. Right. But you said that anything that is not obviously impossible is usually attainable by online learning. Do I no, So within online learning, not not by online learning. So if you have an online learning problem, it's usually solvable unless there is a real problem, like you don't know the future. So that I, I'm saying that if you have a problem that is an online learning problem, it's usually solvable. I'm not saying that everything can okay, be formulated. Sorry, so I, I, okay, so I guess I misunderstood that. What do you mean solvable? What do you mean a solvable online problem, online learning problem? I, I, I'm... I'm so and no, what I'm saying is if you have an online learning problem, if you have a problem that's an online learning problem, so you have, you get, you're getting some data, you need to learn to, you need to minimize empirical loss, or you have, so you, you are now one, you, you are basically it's, it's, you, you're facing some version of a bandit problem. Or, or an expert predict, uh, expert problem. So you you already have an online learning problem. I'm saying that those are usually tractable within this literature. But Nash equilibrium is you cannot formulate it as an online learning problem. So it's not true that if you train a bunch of, bunch of robots to play against each other, you'll get a Nash equilibrium. That's the problem. It's not. So the okay. robots will so, do so well. So forget Nash equilibrium. Not, okay. Okay, I misunderstood. So now you're in the world, but let me still, I'm still not sure I, I follow everything. So we are in the world of online learning. And you say that, uh, that anything that is, I mean, are you saying that anything that is not obviously impossible is possible, but you say obviously impossible is for, for information theoretic reasons. And I'm trying to understand what, what is the content of this statement. So the content, you'll see an example in the context of bandits with knapsacks. So the content is that, uh, okay, so if the information is not there, for example, if you, if, you def, if, if, you, if you need to make revocable decisions and uh, you don't know what to do because what you need to do depends on the future. So that's an information theoretic reason. So... Uh, uh. Well, it's, a lot okay, of you will see an example. Sense, depend on the future, but you can still learn. I mean, right. So, so, right. so that's that's that doesn't yet give a good criteria. Okay. No, it's, say, it's not a good criteria. My point is that a lot of those problems, when you unpack them, there will be NP hard, but or uh, kind of. Uh, but in the algorithms literature, if you have kind of a loss minimization setup, you usually you're in good shape. Uh, 
And okay. let, uh, I'll wait and, for the example. Anyway. You said there will be an example. There will yeah. be an example. So we'll okay. uh, so, maybe in five slides. Okay. I, it's it's just because people yeah. So uh, anyway, so it's I I just want to drive home the point that there is let's say an army of people working on online learning. So we can if we got to a point where it's online learning algorithm, we are in good shape. Uh, Unless it's something impossible, uh, with, uh, you can do a lot. Definitely, you can do a lot better uh, uh, by, uh, yeah. OK, so the standard bandit uh, setup is uh, there are N arms, T rounds. You get a reward. Sometimes it's phrased as a loss, but uh, I want to phrase it as a reward for now. You'll, uh, you'll see why in, in, in a couple of slides. For each action at each time, and uh, the goal is uh, so to achieve either epsilon regret or epsilon swap regret, which means you do as well as the best strategy in hindsight up to some epsilon or as best as any strategy where uh, any strategy for where you're substituting one arm for another consistently. So, but anyway, in any case, you are trying to compete with some set of pre preset strategies in hindsight. So with knapsacks, uh, you have, there's a capacity cost. So you imagine that you, you, each uh, bandit gives you a piece of rock. It has some value, it has some weight, and you have a finite capa a bounded capacity in your knapsack. So, and uh, you're not allowed to exceed. So if your knapsack is full, you have to stop uh, collecting rocks. Uh, we assume that you always have the zero cost, zero reward arm available. So basically the worst that can happen to you is you have to stop, but you're allowed to skip around. And uh, again, there is a epsilon regret can be defined in the same way. So here is an example of what I said uh, for this very simple example of uh, why you cannot solve bandits with knapsacks uh, with negligible regret for information theoretic reasons. So imagine there are two universes. You have a budget of T in one, uh, and the cost of every piece of rock is two. So you can afford to pick half the, uh, half the rewards. So in universe one, in both universes, the first half you get reward one per rock. In one universe, then you get reward zero. In the second universe, you get reward two. So in this case, uh, constant fraction regret is unavoidable because you don't know what the future will look like. And it's different from standard uh, bandits because decisions that you made in the past will limit you in the future. So either if you don't pull those arms, you'll uh, not be able to collect rewards in the future. If you do pull those arms, sorry, if yeah. So if you don't pull those arms, you'll regret it here because now you, you don't get any reward. If you do pull, you'll regret it here because now you can't collect high rewards. So unfortunately, it's not, I wish it was, uh, yeah, it would simplify life a lot if it was uh, online learnable, but uh, there is uh, this problem. Actually, it's but, a, it's sorry, a, sorry, can I, can I, uh... I mean, it's unfair. I think it's an unfair com comparison. I mean, you are trying to beat, to get small regret, but in a sense, I mean, let, let me say it this way. You are trying to get a, a, a small regret from T experiments where you are limited to T over two experiments. Well, I mean, of course, I mean, uh, but that's not what you should compare to. You should compare to something that is also limited to T over two experiments. I mean, the cost, the cost should be limited also for the offline, otherwise, I mean, this no, is the not cost the is limited, but, but the offline knows what will happen. The offline knows whether it's two or zero, so it will decide. The offline knows that in S in S one universe it should pull the first arms, and in oh, S two it should okay. pull the second arms. But the uh, online until T over two doesn't learn what to do. And and if I pull every every even arm every even period, you'll I'm get uh, regret. That's probably the best, or maybe two to one split, and you'll get regret one and a half ratio or something like that. Okay. Okay, good. So that's what I meant by information theory. So yeah, it's still unfair, but it's uh, kind of, but it is, uh, we are, comp yeah, so the hindsight one will be optimal. 
Uh, so, but it's actually a one parameter problem. So this is of course a simple scenario. I could give you a very complicated scenario. Still, there will be only a one parameter kind of problem. If uh, with a hint of one real number, you could attain low regret, which is the target bank per back. So all you need to know is how much, how much uh, dollars per, uh, per gram should I accept for my NAPSA? So if you knew this target, the best in hindsight R, I could replace the reward with reward minus R times cost and treat it as a standard online learning problem. So it's, it's kind of important that it's a one parameter per, per instance uh, problem. So we need so to- That's like a Lagrange multiplier, right? This R. Yeah, yes, exactly. Okay. Uh, and that's the thing, the only thing that you cannot learn online, or at least I think in practice you could, but so at some point, yeah, anyway, so my hope is that it's a, it, this problem doesn't happen in practice in many places. Okay, so just to, re, to recap, uh, VCG converts optimization to mechanism, but needs money and very sensitive to errors, online low regret, leads to correlated equilibrium bandits with naps up to one single global parameter per player or like standard bandits. So let's, let's say we can use them. So now we put those ingredients together. So now there are, suppose there is no money. Uh, each player submits a utility function FI and we give everyone B tokens. So those tokens are worthless. Uh, but they're allowed to spend at most B tokens and they run VCG. So we maximize uh, the sum and charge them in tokens. Okay, so suppose some ma something magical happens and the VCG price for each player is exactly B. So the, everyone's externality is equalized. So the result is a correlated equilibrium by truthfulness of VCG. You can, each player cannot report a different FI and improve their outcome because without breaking through the budget B, even though B, the the budget is in tokens, it's still, the truthfulness of VCG still gives us this fact that the outcome is a correlated equilibrium. You cannot get anything better than your current outcome by reporting a different FI. So uh, a natural uh, next step is each player submits FI, we give everyone B tokens and uh, we scale utilities and try to uh, achieve this state where uh, everyone's ex externality is B. Uh, sorry to interrupt. I mean, uh, that was too fast. Can you go back? I mean, I'm trying to understand. Sorry. Uh, mm -hmm. Why why, why is this a correlated equilibrium? Uh, okay, not so a Nash equilibrium. Not a Nash equilibrium? Well, because I... I mean, of course, a Nash equilibrium is a correlated equilibrium, but your point is that this that you are going beyond Nash. Right, that's the point you're trying to make. So, this specifically, uh, well, this specifically would be a Nash, but uh, the next slide definitely will. Okay, not be. okay. Then, then I have no quarrel. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but I want to. Yes. Yeah, so the next slide will not be. And, Ma and Mark, uh, before, Mark, before moving on, can you explain what you mean by everybody equal? Uh, everyone's externality equalized. So I'm just VCG prices are externalities, right? In to, uh, so it's just saying that the VCG price. So VCG prices, uh, VCG prices are externalities. It's how much externality you you, how much you affect other players, right. and everyone has the same price means everyone's externality is equalized. But uh, there is no. Effectively, there is no price here, right? These are like worthless tokens, so I'm a bit confused. Yes, but in those worthless tokens, uh, if I, you are in some sense, if you ask how much does everyone affect everyone else, it will be the same number B. And every time you have mechanisms without money, there is this problem. What do you equalize, right? So B is not BI, right? The number of tokens is no. equal for everybody. It's equal for everybody because we are going to do mechanisms without money. And you always, in mechanisms without money, I'll touch on it if I have time for the two sided match. And there is this problem that you, it's a normative decision. What do you equalize? Right. And uh, uh, it happens in voting, it happens in matching. What 
but because when when there is money you don't have this problem without money there is always this degree of freedom but we'll we'll get back to it so let me let me get to the algorithm and then we can discuss some more maybe the examples that will be uh, easier uh, okay so now we add scaling factors and try to achieve the same state so suppose we discover we found some lambda is such that this is still true so with those lambda is uh, the externality of each player is equalized then the result is still a correlated equilibrium now it's definitely not Nash because the lambdas do depend on the f's um, but uh, it's still a correlated equilibrium for the same reason uh, if I fix a lambda and I fix a, a lambda i, I fix everyone else's f's uh, again. So you cannot, uh, if your budget is b, you cannot get anything better with f i prime. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, the fact that the lambdas depend on the f's by some rule, or whatever you know, the rule is that uh, that you get exactly you equalize uh, you equalize the VCG prices. So given a, given a vector f1 up to fn, you find lambda 1 up to lambda, if I understand correctly what you mean. Mm -hmm. If not, then you're correct. I didn't say how I find it, but uh, uh, there, yes. Well, there is. There is, and uh, even unique or whatever. You know, you are in a, in, a, in a beautiful world where everything works for you. Uh, there are lambda 1 up to lambda n, depending on the vector f1 up to fn, for which the VCG prices are equal, are equalized. Mm -hmm. OK? Yes. Uh, why is this still a correlated equilibrium? Correct equilibrium has to do with information, private information or public information. So you make the lambdas. Has. So the but, lambdas uh, are public. Sorry? You make the lambdas public. You make all the Fs public. Okay. So given so, your lambda, all the lambdas and all the Fs, if you change your own F, you you cannot as, so we freeze the lambdas. So we are not gonna change them because you changed your F. So in this world, okay. Uh, so, so for every for every vector of lambdas, there is an Nash equilibrium. I mean, I mean, of course you can call it you can call this a correlated equilibrium. Essentially, you are land, you are you know you have different lambdas for each one. You have a Nash equilibrium, so it's a collection of Nash equilibria. If the lambdas are chosen by a, by a stochastic process, then it is a mixture, a probabilistic mixture of Nash, which is correlated. But this is not a correlated equilibrium. What correlated equilibrium really means? I mean, it, it's, 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 some, it's some very formal way or something, but this does not capture. No, no, but, uh, it's, it Unless is. I'm missing something. I mean, the important examples, uh, anyway, so it's, I wish it wasn't, but uh, yeah, so then we would have solved voting and other things, but uh, and yeah, it is uh, because uh, you, you might affect, basically one way to think about it in, the, I mean, yeah, uh, anyway, one way to think about it is uh, is kind of you, everyone submits preferences and you create market clearing prices or something. And definitely you can affect those prices. Uh, and once you take this into account, everything collapses in terms of incentives. But given the prices, everything is truthful. So uh, those- I still don't uh, see anything that goes beyond Nash here. I'm sorry, but- uh... Okay, I, I would be, it's, it's in my favor, but I wish. Okay. But uh, uh, anyway, so, so, okay, now going back to algorithms, we can learn those scaling factors and that's our kind of the main, the main algorithm and mechanism we propose is basically an adaptive pricing mechanism where we have an iterated optimization loop for now we are learning, we using online learning to learn Lambda ITs plus a regularizer. I mean, it's, we are tying it back to optimization. So there is some regularizer that will hopefully because that will make it algorithmically nicer, but only cause diminishing pain. Uh, so in the main loop, we optimize this, charge players and tokens, and run a local VCG. So locally, this problem is not too bad because if I remove one player uh, the, with the regularizer, essentially, uh, hopefully the new optimum doesn't go too far. I can solve it by gradient descent or even cal calculated based on the Hessian. Uh, and I think of learning the lambdas basically by learning, by running something like bandit with knapsacks. So and as an individual player, 
basically I think about it as you, you submit a Lambda, you get some cost and some reward and you're learning to play this game. Uh, so uh, you get, so this is a generic reduction. I assume that there is a local optimization heuristic H that can maximize or minimize a, a function over the outcome space X and uh, that it consists of a sequence of local steps. And on top of it, we, we put uh, 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 learning the lambdas. And uh, in there, so we get a trajectory. So uh, uh, that is the result of this online learning process. And then the end, we output either the end point or the typical point on this trajectory. It could be a distribution of points. So, uh, so the only requirement is uh, that so instead, so global VCG can be very bad. Global optimization can be very bad. The only requirement is that locally everything is well behaved. So the, the local optimization step is simple so that VCG is well behaved. And this is so if you have, if the local optimization step is regularized gradient descent, that that is true. So basically you make locally, it looks like a simple kind of convex optimization step. Uh, even if globally things can be very bad. So that's uh, that's the main algorithm. Uh, so again, so uh, so the main step, so we collect, we assume that the Fs are given ahead of time. Uh, uh, we only really need a, usually a gradient oracle to the Fs. We collect B at every step. So those are not real steps and then it's not, it's not time, it's kind of uh, just a loop to, for computation purposes. We collect bids from the players. So we select some regularizer. Uh, we run, this is the objective function on which we run the VCG. We obtain the new, uh, we use the heuristic to obtain a new point in the optimization space. We calculate prices, charge players and tokens and repeat. And for players, we are, we suggest that they run bandits report FI truthfully and run bandits with knapsacks to learn the lambda to kind of to learn to play the, the lambda. So it's I I think okay. So if, in general, we cannot prove that this converges, and uh, there are good reasons for this. But it it actually. On the flip side, in, I, I think whenever H is reasonable, this should converge, or at least with the same amount of tricks that goes into online optimization, we should be able to. So it seems like it could work anywhere the current online optimization magic works. We'll get some formal results though, that uh, kind of on the theory side of things. Uh, I don't have, uh, we, we have some experimental results with voting, with social choice, but I don't have a lot of empirical data to kind of on the more open-ended tasks, like I don't know, ad serving or something, but so let's get back to the theory. So the main equilibrium result, if, if this algorithm converges to a solution where each player has low regret, then you get an equi a correlated equilibrium from equal endowments. Uh, which means that, uh, yes, yeah, so no player benefits from misreporting. Uh, so for example, what happens if you run it? So uh, you are you're trying to allocate one indivisible good to two players. So the game is repeated second price auction. And what will happen is basically at every point you submit a bid and tokens. And uh, if you win, you pay this many tokens and the players, the dynamics should converge to a place where both fluctuate around two and each player wins about half the rounds and pays two for every round that the player wins. There is also an infinitesimal version that seems to be useful because it gives you some kind of prices in the abstract space X. So yeah, so if we assume that uh, this FT is differentiable and that the difference between X, uh, uh, XT and the XTI is small, we can charge uh, something that's based on the gradient and the Hessian. And you can see that the, the, the cost is quadratic because doubling the gradient uh, quadruples the value of the function 
at the point. So if I have a convex fun a quadratic function, if I double the gradient, the value of the function uh, uh, quadruples at the place where that gradient, uh, that's the gradient of the function. So you get the quadratic pricing mechanism uh, locally. Uh, so let me. Uh, I... Sorry, I, I, uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, maybe I'm the only one who doesn't understand, but I don't. Now, you had a simple example two slides ago. Are you willing to? Yes. Are you willing to, to spend some time explaining it? I mean, maybe I'm taking you off track and so on, but I must say that I'm completely lost. Now, uh, so perhaps this yes. is a good, a good it was a perhaps bit... you can explain this a little more, but perhaps- Okay, so, uh, so let me, since we usually, let, let's ignore kind of the, the math and let's say, so those are the rules. You get T tokens, there are two players. It's a mechanism without money. So all we can do is tokens. Each of us, there is a one indivisible item. There are T tokens and the rules are you bid some tokens, you get the item, uh, the winner gets the item, pays the second price. Uh, and we both everything in tokens, everything in tokens. Everything yes? in tokens. The only thing that's real is that we get shares of the item. In the end, that's the probability distribution. So I get the item with the probability of the, that's the fraction of rounds I won. And if I exceed budget T, then I cannot play anymore. I see. Okay. So each round you are selling prob a probability share of one over T of the object. Yes. Essentially. Okay. Yes, using a second price auction and tokens. And I hope that a reasonable pricing will emerge because we have a long time to play. But if I just bid two at every round, then you know I win half of the rounds and charge two for the half of the rounds that I'm, mm -hmm. I'm bidding, right? Yes. So why, why, why do you fluctuate anything here? I mean, um, yeah, it's kind of, okay, so let's, uh, because I don't want equality, so you'll see it kind of, it will fluctuate around too, if you were to write some kind of gradient update, right? But, okay, but is, is the claim here is that this will always happen in every correlated equilibrium or there exists uh, a correlated equilibrium? Okay, so I understand. I'm not, here it's an example, I'm not claiming anything. I'll have a theorem about this specific scenario in a few slides. Okay. Uh, I, I, here it's just to get an intuition. The goal is to, okay, so we can prove something. The typical theorem here is of the form, if it converges, then good things happen. And the hope is that the convergence part will be handled by the same people who, who currently can do kind of great things with gradient descent. So I really, the goal is to do as well as, as, as existing the whole kind of array of heuristics that exist there to be able to use them for mechanisms. So I deliberately don't want to put more, yeah, to, to prove more things that would then fail. Incidentally, if you learn from the game theoretic literature, convergence is immaterial. What you know, it doesn't matter if it converges or not. You know that after enough time, you are close to some correlated equilibrium, which may change from period to period. But you are you are in an epsilon neighborhood of the set of correlated equilibria. So convergence is immaterial. Now I don't know if that will help in your case. In, but in my uh, case, it's again I, I, there is this problem of one parameter that it's it's almost true. Uh, the problem is that yeah, if if bandits with knapsacks could be learned, then this would be completely true. As is, it should I think it's much more true in practice than in theory. But let let's see some theorems. Uh, actually, so let's see some applications and then uh, we'll get one new theorem that uh, about one sided allocation. So, in voting, actually, so here, so one application that we can hope for is for cardinal voting. Uh, so, we, we can, the desired properties are truthfulness, efficiency. There are a lot of impossibility results that unfortunately extend even to this case. Uh, cardinal voting, so most voting is ordinal, typically you, you rank candidates, but in some cases, uh, ordinal voting is inherently inefficient. So it kind of many schemes in, in a simple example like this would produce a winner take all, as, even though D should be kind of the winning candidate. Uh, but for example, if, I mean, in some elimination, maybe D will win, but if, uh, in a, in, in a runoff, 
uh, one of the three those three candidates win, wins uh, so here the outcome space is is the simplex is distributions over the alternatives and we, you can run a, this algorithm with various uh, regularizers and what you get is quadratic prices you get an outcome with quadratic prices to influence the outcome which is kind of similar to quadratic voting it can have multiple equilibria and i think it's it's a real uh, it's a real problem so you you get the problems that you had with um, kind of all those impossibility results extend to this model uh, but uh, at least locally you get truthful voting so what you get is uh, so this is a dynamics of we fix a point we let everyone vote with the same budget where would the vote go and uh, once you have an equilibrium which is guaranteed to exist by fixed point results uh, basically you have a price so this ellipse so there is a regularizer that keeps you away from the boundary you you get some ellipse that uh, th this is where each player gets to pick their favorite direction on this ellipse and uh, when you add up all the votes you get a gradient of the regularizer and technically locally each player gets to influence so it's a true uh, basically they face a quadratic menu of prices to influence the outcome of the votes it's easier to influence it in the direction a b than in there is in this direction because there is not so much space in this direction. Uh, so you get different prices for different directions, but it's a quadratic function. Uh, it's an ongoing work. Uh, I'm, I'm, the main thing here, if you want a one line summary, we are looking for benchmarks. I think heuristically we are doing much better than kind of other heuristics, but it's hard to validate this statement. So it's, it's, uh, we are looking for benchmarks actually. Uh, okay, so for one side of the location, actually, I have seven minutes, so I do want to state one theorem. So the one side of the location world, there are n players and n items. Each player wants exactly one item. There are utilities. Let's say they're between zero and one. The outcome is a bistochastic matrix that tells who gets what with what probability. There is a re famous result by Helen and Zeckhauser that there are uh, there is a competitive equilibrium where there are prices pj on items and an allocation such that each player gets their favorite it, you give each player one unit of token and each player gets their fa uh, for each player their xi is their favorite bundle up subject to those bu budget constraints and prices and uh, it's proved using Kakutani's fixed point theorem, and it's actually has been shown to be PPAD hard in general to find uh, those prices. So this, uh, so actually, I uh, I wanted to see what you get by just plugging it, this problem into this framework. And it, I thought I would just recover this Highland Zeckhauser theorem, but it actually gives a refinement of it. So the new the refinement is that there is a scaling factors lambda i such that you get Highland Zeckhauser prices that are the result of running unit demand VCG on those scaled utilities. So I tell you scale the first player by two, the second player by half, and so on. You run VCG, which is just unit demand auction in this case. You get prices on items. Those prices are Highland Zeckhauser prices. So it's a refinement because it, it gives some additional structural form. Uh, so there is an execution of VCG with those scales utilities where each player spend, either spends exactly one unit or spends less than one and is maximally happy. Uh, that leads to this matrix X. Interestingly, it's, it's a one directional theorem. So it's not an if and only if. Uh, there are Highland Zeckhauser prices that are not VCG prices. Here is an example of that. So we have four players, four players and four items, and those are the utilities. So, uh, and here is this is a valid uh, Highland Zeckhauser pricing. So the first item costs 1.1, the second item costs 0.9. 
the third item costs two and the fourth item costs zero. So in this case, the first and second player will, will only spend money on A and B because it's not worth their while to spend money on C because then they'll have to get D some of the time and it's not worth for them. So they only get A and B, the second two players only get C and D. So it's, it's, it's a proper compet uh, co competitive equilibrium. But in any VCG, you see that B is only two players want B. So in any VCG pricing scheme, B should be priced at zero because it's not over demanded. And uh, so this, you can never get those prices. And in some sense, A and B could complain that why the only reason, so put it on zero price of B, the only thing it does, it sucks money out of uh, the first two players to prevent them from bidding on C. So there is no reason why here B actually should be priced at anything above zero. And indeed there is a different equilibrium where, uh, with, so you take those scalings, you get those VCG prices and uh, a different correlated uh, competitive equilibrium. Now with basically those prices are the result of running second, uh, unit demand auction with uh, with those utilities and uh, you get uh, a, a highland zeckhauser equilibrium supported by vcg prices uh, it's not true that okay so uh, also is is this discovered uh, can you discover it by just writing uh, this uh, learning algorithm so it's not true that any low regret apex execution corresponds to this kind of equilibrium, but if you add, if you add a small regularizer to the objective function, then it becomes true. And the reason is that this is technically a low regret execution. So uh, remember this uh, the same set in two players. So if player one bids three consistently and player two oscillates between bidding four and one and a half. You can see something very unfair happens. One third of the time, the second player wins and, and pays two, three. Two thirds of the time, the first player wins and pays one and a half. Technically, it's, a, it's a, an equilibrium. Nobody has an incentive to deviate, but clearly it's a bad one. It's not, it doesn't correspond to any competitive pricing or anything. But if you added a small regularizer, this actually will stop being a low regret solution because the second player will want to move their uh, bids closer to each other. And uh, so actually it's a, you can prove that uh, with a regularizer term, actually any low regret execution does correspond to, to a solution that is this VCG highlight, Highland Zeckhauser pricing. So this, uh, okay, so in, let me just in two minutes uh, talk about the two-sided. So in two-sided, so this uh, I must say we. Uh, I I kind of I I was uh, I was surprised that you uh, that uh, you get some new result by just plugging it into a framework. I thought I would just recover Highland Zeckhauser. So it was uh, it was interesting that it's not exactly what happens for two-sided matching. It's even more interesting. So. Again, so the vast so two-sided matching without money, most results are about ordinal settings and about stability, in part because it's hard to reason about cardinal settings. You can plug everything into this framework uh, as is and get meaningful results. There is already a very simple, so and just food for thought, a simple normative question there. So here is a, a very simple scenario, simple as it gets for matching. There are two hospitals, two doctors. Doctor one is more popular. Hospital one is more popular. What should happen? So if you equalize externalities, it depends what it's kind of half of political kind of discourses about what's your externality. So externality is utility with the one minus utility without the one minus utility with the one. Now, when you calculate the with and without, so with it's clear what it means. It's what happens. 
without does it mean that d1 is there working but not expressing preferences or does it mean that d1 is completely out of the system and depending on whether you define it one way or another so basically paraphrasing it in colloquial terms so d1 is popular does this fact belong to d1 or to the commons so if it belongs to d1 then you the apex will output stable uh, the assortative matching because that's what happens when you equalize externality uh, accrue, where D1's popularity accrues to, to D1. So this is, and uh, if to the commons, then you get a uniform distribution because then everyone's preferences is the, is the same. So everyone's outcome should be the same. Uh, so there, there are already kind of interesting questions there in terms of definitions, which is, I think there should be theorems there, but there should also there is an interesting discussion about definitions uh one or two quick comments uh, about next uh, what's possible uh, so this everything we said was about the one shot fi static but actually the way it's phrased we can interleave kind of those learning cycles the cycles where they have sexually changed because you learn something about the outside environment so it's possible to, to kind of mix it with online learning, with actual online learning and uh, joint control. We only, most of this can work only with the gradient oracle access to the FIs. Uh, so my kind of dream in terms of applications is to have a cookbook. This looks like something that you can put on top of many more algorithms as a black box. Uh, Another ML theory question is kind of for the, you can, in online, yes, yeah, so is there basically, if the FIs now are not preferences, but beliefs, is there a reasonable interpretation of what we are trying to do and maybe for robust learning. So it's kind of like saying, I'll equalize all pieces of evidence to have some bearing on the, the same amount of surprise on the outcome or something like that. And uh, on the optimization level, so in correlated equilibria, we know that you can online learn correlated Nash, but you also can write a linear program. Can we, re in which cases can we replace the main loop with uh, direct optimization? Uh, and uh, yeah, so then uh, there, you, there are also questions about, uh, in the mechanism design space, but uh, maybe those I can take offline. Thank you.